So good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to this uh, fourth edition of our series on Indian scientists. It's a series that Sudipto and I have been curating uh, since uh, late 2019, and uh, in which we try to highlight the work of pioneering Indian scientists of the recent period, late 19th or mostly 20th century. And our objective is very simple. It is that you know, we may have heard their names. In fact, sometimes we have not even heard their names. But even if we have, it's not commonly uh, that we understand what they have done, what their work has been, what their challenges were that they met in their lives. So we've dealt in the past with physicists, with mathematicians, biologists, chemists, and um, we will be now today uh, moving a little further afield since uh, we have uh, Mrs. Tara Gandhi, who will be speaking on, on the famous Indian ornithologist, in fact, father of Indian ornithology, as, as is the title of her talk, uh, the great uh, Salim Ali. And, um, and then this will be up to about four o'clock, and then we will have our own Sudipto speaking on uh, A.K. Roy Choudhury, the, 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 the Indian physicist. So for now, I will uh, introduce uh, Mrs. Tara Gandhi, first of all, thanking her for kindly sparing her time to be with us. She's a distinguished ornithologist herself. She was in fact a student of Salim Ali uh, long ago in, in uh, Bombay and um, when she was doing her MSc in ornithology. And uh, she has authored several books on, on Indian birds and bird watching and, and uh, uh, contributed quite a bit to the discipline also by uh, being involved with the work of a number of leading institutions dealing with wildlife. So with this brief introduction, I will simply request our auditors, our listeners to keep themselves muted until uh, the question and answer session at the end. Uh, you are also welcome to use the chat box to type your questions even in the middle of the session if you so wish and then we will read and select some of them uh, apart from live interaction with with Mrs. Tara Gandhi. So thank you once again Mrs. Tara Gandhi and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much Professor Danino and Chudit Pesharkar for inviting me. It is, uh, I feel very honored to uh, be part of a, be a speaker at this uh, series that you have you know, in, instituted. And I'm very grateful to you for uh, uh, giving me the pleasure and the privilege of uh, talking about uh, Dr. Salim Ali, my teacher and my mentor. So now we know that uh, uh, Salim Ali was well known as India's bird man, or as the greatest Indian ornithologist, but it's lesser known that actually he was responsible for advancement of conservation biology in India, which was a science that was quite unknown at that time. But now it's being um, widely taught in universities and wildlife institutes all over the country. Now, at that time when Salim Ali started off, you know, it was considered to be a leisure pastime of the British uh, or very rich people who had nothing else better to do but to go and look at birds. But Salim Ali made ornithology and field ornithology into a serious discipline. Now, he studied birds of nearly every region of the subcontinent, and he very significantly brought into focus the need for interdisciplinary studies. It was not just the bird itself, but it had to be the study of the natural ecosystems that the birds lived in, the botany, zoology, entomology, economics, ecology, biogeography, and so on. And even the uh, abiotic conditions, the natural conditions of the soil, the water, all that behavioral sciences, all these things combined into the study of uh, ornithology. So, Salim Mali received during his lifetime many awards, the Padma Vibhushan and the three honorary doctorates, the Paul Getty Award, which is like an, almost like a Nobel Prize for conservation and many other medals and, uh, and uh, honors he received. And he was uh, 
nominated to Rajya Sabha in 1985. Now, having been born at the end of the 19th century and lived for 91 years nearly, Asali Malik covered almost the entire 20th century. He was a true 20th century scientist. And his life and work actually linked two huge eras in the history of biological science in India, which was the British period, where a lot of documentation, very serious documentation of the flora and fauna of the country, and you know, the physiology of, of uh, birds and animals ha happened at that time. And the post-independence period, which was dedicated towards ecology, biodiversity conservation, and sustainable development. These were all the, the more modern factors that went into study of uh, biological sciences. So this kind of just juxtaposition where Salim Mali was, was living in at this time when he was spanning two different eras within the century, actually made him evolve himself. He evolved from his own colonial style upbringing and background <clears throat> into a modern ecologist and a strong conservation advocate he became. And so this kind of shows how receptive he was to change and to modern international uh, techniques and, and uh, standards. His contemporaries, of course, were luminaries of the time. We know all these faces and names so very well. Um, some were before him, and many of them overlapped uh, quite significantly with his own uh, lifetime. Uh, Salim Ali's science was different from theirs, of course, because it was grounded on observation and recording of the living world. He, he took everything out of laboratories and school and classrooms, and he went into the living outside the world. And according to Professor Madhav Gargi, <clears throat> eminent professor of ecology, this was something entirely novel in the Indian scene at that time. <clears throat> Excuse me. I am coming to myself. I'm really fortunate, extremely fortunate to have been a student. And during the last years of his life, he actually took me on as a student when he was 87 years old, a time when most people have retired long ago. He took me on as a student. And when I went to see him for the first time, I knew that he was a monumental personality. So actually, I imagined him to be a, a huge muscular person with a big booming voice. But I was pleasantly surprised to see he was very small made and wiry and slim and energetic, of course. And uh, I was, of course, terrified, terrified to meet this eminent uh, person. I was just a candidate to, uh, to become for an MSc. And I had to, I don't know why they took me to meet the big man. <laughs> that could have gone through some other, but he, they did. And he spoke to me kindly, but the kindness had a string attached to it. He wouldn't, he would accept me only after putting me through some kind of an endurance test by going into the, he sent me off to Point Calime, which is a research station of the of, uh, BNHS and made sure that, that this candidate was able to live a rough life and camp, in, and live in a camp situation and, uh, and uh, be like everybody else in, in the field. So it's only then that he decided to take students on. So now I met Salim, Dr. Salim Ali when he was an eminent personality, uh, celebrity already. But anybody who knew him when he was a boy would never have imagined that he would have uh, reached such a stature. But he was not good at studies at all. And he actually disliked maths. So that was a, quite a tough one there. And, but he had a dream. He had a dream of taking up zoology and ornithology. And then, of course, also being an explorer and a hunter and all that. That was a child's dream. You see, he was actually from a very distinguished family, from a very large and distinguished family in Bombay. Now, of course, Mumbai. Uh, there was a president of the National Congress over there. There were members of the Indian Civil Service. They were very, very high distinguished people. And, but his parents both died when he was just three years old and he had eight other siblings. So these nine children were brought up with a very close knit and loving family. And all these nine children were brought up by an aunt and uncle who were themselves childless and they looked after the entire him and his siblings all the time. So 
when he's about eight or nine years old, his uncle gave him an air gun. His uncle was Shikari. He, I mean, he was, they were all at that time, it was a very accepted um, uh, activity for people of that, you know, of, his, of, the, of the civil service and, and, and that time. So he went with an air gun. And this little boy, with all his siblings and friends, used to roam around in the garden and shoot little birds. So, and his favorite was to shoot sparrows. So, but <laughs> the reason for shooting the sparrows was so to get them, to take them to the kitchen and get them cooked for a snack. So that was his main interest. But one day he found a sparrow, which was a bit different. It had this kind of yellow patch on its, on its, on its chin. And he got interested. He took it to his uncle and uncle said, look, I have a friend um, in the Bombay Naturalist Society. Why don't you take it there and get, get it uh, identified? So, so Salim Ali says he went there and again, he was actually terrified because he had to go into this huge, big, uh, rather ominous looking building full of stuffed animals and uh, skeletons <laughs> hanging on the wall, these trophies on the walls. And he'd never met an Englishman in his life before. But Mr. Millard was very kind and he not only identified the bird, but he also um, told, showed him around. And you can see the what Salim Ali has said in yellow, our tears is like ripples from a pebble dropped in water, the circles of my interest in ornithology widened. So that is when he started getting truly interested again. And of course, that was called the yellow throated sparrow, and uh, which is now renamed as the chestnut shouldered petronia. It was a different species altogether. Uh, he wanted to study birds only, but his family had other aspirations for him. They knew there was no money in ornithology or even in nature studies. There was, there were no professional uh, profession at that time which he could fit into. So they had their businesses in Burma, Myanmar at that time, and they they sent him off as a teenager. He was about eighteen years old. They sent him off there to try and work in their family uh, mining and uh, and uh, wood based uh, businesses out there. So he went and spent a couple of years, and that's about all he could tolerate. He came right back. He became familiar with Burmese birds at that time. Uh, he returned to Bombay, and again, his family enrolled him into a course in commercial law and accountancy, hoping that at least he would take some interest in uh, the business, uh, hoping against hope, actually, I suppose, that he would take some interest in the business and uh, take over some part of it. But... Uh, uh, but Salim Ali had kept in touch with the BNHS the entire time that he was in, in Burma and even ever since he was 10 or 11 years old, he kept in touch. And there he had a very good friend who was an apprentice to Stanley Prater. Prater is the future author, was the future author of the famous book on Indian animals. He was a zoologist and he was an apprentice at the, at the BNHS at that time. And he was studying, uh, he was studying for his uh, bachelor's degree in zoology. So actually, Salim Ali, um, as a young man, he got, he was, I think, inspired by Prater in a way, and decided to himself do his BSc in zoology. Um, so after his finishing his uh, morning lessons at the, at the commerce school, he used to get onto his motorbike. Instantly, Salim Ali was passionate about motorbikes as well, apart from birth. And he, had, he always had motorbikes and he loved to scoot around <clears throat> and them at top speed, apparently. So he used to pick up Prater and they'd both go to college and study together, which was nice for Salim Mary because he had a good companion. And after class, he would go back to BNHS and they would rummage through the library and you know, rummage among the bird collection, as he called, to learn more about Indian birds. Now he was about 24, 25 years old, and uh, uh, he got married. And his bride was from an extremely sophisticated and, uh, cult and from family, affluent family. She'd grown up in England, she studied over there. And he was actually very unsure whether she would uh, fit into his kind of uh, rather uncertain way of life, his insecure way of life, where he didn't have a job, he, didn't, uh, he would live anywhere. Uh, but she turned out to be the most wonderful companion for him. She went with him everywhere and uh, she, she uh, shared his interests 
And in fact, he in fact helped him with his writing and with the, you know, they say polishing up his, uh, his articles and his writing work because the English was so good. Well, and she went with him to Burma as well. They went back and back and forth. They went like this to Burma and back. And eventually the, the business folded up. I don't know whether it's because of Salim Ali's uh, not being able to handle it or, or for other reasons, it folded up. And they, the couple came back to Bombay. And again, he was homeless, he was jobless. And the family um, all uh, pitched in and they gave him accommodation. They looked after the couple. And eventually he got his first job. And this was at the natural history section of the Prince of Wales Museum in Bombay. Now, of course, it is renamed. And um, so there was a natural history section over there. And he uh, was kind of like a guide lecturer uh, for all the visitors. As the visitors came, he had to take them around and show them the, the, uh, all the installations out there and explain to them what it was all about. So he did that for two years. But he got very tired of that job. It was kind of repetitive. He, and he was you know, he not learning anything more. And he had this desire, he had this very keen desire to be trained really well in ornithology. And there was, he says, he says over here, ornithology was always being the Cinderella of Indian zoology. And there was no university or institution where such training would be had. So he got an opportunity to go to Berlin to the University Zoological Museum there. And there he went through very interesting and detailed and excellent taxonomic studies and field-based ornithological training under very inspirational teachers, this Professor Erwin Straisman, who he called his guru. And he learned about the life history of birds, their migration patterns. He also had another inspirational teacher called Heinrich, who taught him about bird behavior and about uh, relationship between the bird and its, and its uh, natural environment. So he learned the science of ethology from him and the study of the live bird and it's the biogeography as they call it, the entire geography of its, uh, of its life he learned from there. So then he came back to India, of course, and uh, within, after finishing that for, uh, for some years, the very, very, very productive. Uh, he says over there that, uh, that Berlin is where I learned everything. I learned it was it was a turning point of my career where I learned how to do serious bird studies. So when he came back, again the same story. He was about he was like thirty five years old or so. He was jobless. He had a wife to support. So he applied to this was around nineteen thirty, still under British rule. So he applied to BNHS and uh, he realized that there were no serious studies happen in India. And he offered to do it, uh, take on huge surveys uh, um, of, uh, of large tracts of, of land, uh, which had not been really covered on systematic bird survey, had not been done in India uh, so far. So he did that, and his wife went with him, and they, they, they as you can see, they, they camped out in, in, in camps like this. They went on bullock carts, and they went on broken down cars, they went and here she is uh, in a peculiar little tram car that they were in and they lived like that for many years and or many months at a time I would say many months and they do the survey and come back somewhere and uh, he and they lived like that and he worked that way systematically recording what he observed over there the birds of, of, of uh, Travancore and Cochin and Mysore a state, huge states he went to at all that and they collected birds as well. That and those days they had to collect them uh, for the museum samples. And so she accompanied him everywhere. And he worked gratis. He made no money out of that, but he only took money for this for the attendance and the infrastructure. But in 1939, there was terrible tragedy in his life, and his wife died at a very young age uh, after some minor surgery. Very unexpectedly, she died. So. This was a terrible, uh, tragic time that uh, he, he went through, and uh, he was uh, quite uh, quite distraught. And um, but his very loving sister Kamu uh, said that you know you can't live alone any longer. You have to uh, move in with us. And you know he had no children. Salim Ali had no children. So he was completely alone. So he moved in with his sister and brother-in-law into their house in, uh, in, in Pali Hill. On Pali Hill, there was this beautiful big house, the family uh, house. 
and uh, he lived there for he based himself out of there for for nearly 40 years ever since uh, his wife died he was based in this house and he was completely distraught and uh, but at that time what he did was he completely he plunged himself deeper and deeper into his work which was his passion of course but he plunged himself deeper into that and uh, it became his uh, his sole occupation from, from then onwards so in 1941, the Book of Indian Birds came out, the first, and that made him instantly famous. Uh, it was a remarkable book, which was easy to read and very, very popular it became. And as soon as it came out, he became famous and it eventually went into 13 editions. It's quite, a, quite an achievement for a book of that type in those days. And it was read by the big and the famous Jawaharlal Nehru, Indira Gandhi, all read his book. And also, very significantly, uh, Dylan Ripley, who was at that time an American postgraduate biology student from Yale University who was serving in, during the war in Asia. He read the book and he sought out Salim Ali. And, and then that became a very strong friendship and a very strong collaboration between these two ardent uh, uh, bird, uh, bird experts. And Dylan Ripley later on became the head of the Smithsonian Institute in, in Washington. And that again uh, came, uh, resulted in a very good collaboration between the BNHS and the Smithsonian. Uh, they were able to support uh, a number of research projects. And the two of them worked together and brought out what is called their magnum opus. It's a 10 volume uh, compilation called the Handbook of Birds of India and Pakistan which document, which has describes every single species of bird in the whole subcontinent, which was known at that time. Not only the description of the birds, but their, their habitat, their nesting habits, their feeding habits. It's a remarkable, absolutely remarkable, huge uh, work that they, they both did together. So Salim Ali, uh, from the, then onwards, he continued his travels, he continued his surveys, taking on smaller, bigger, all kinds of surveys throughout his life. And he, as before, he continued to travel he, from east to west, north to south of India. He went from the town of Kutch on different types of transport. As you can see, he went on camel back, he went on boats through central India. He went to Chilika Lake. And then he went to the rainforest, the Western Ghats, and he went to Arunachal Pradesh and Sikkim and everywhere. And Sikkim, he went on yak back, on elephant back in the south. And on foot, he went, he crossed, he crossed the Himalaya as well, went to the Tibetan plateau on a very arduous trek because he wanted to see the birds over there, the birds that nested over there in the summer and came down to the peninsula in, in winter. So these are all the major expeditions he did over several, several decades. And during this time, he met, he, he met another person who became a very close friend. He called him a kindred spirit because he was so passionate in, in, in just in birds as well. It was Lok Wan Tho. And they uh, traveled together, they studied, they, they researched together, they surveyed together. Lok Wan Tho was a very wealthy uh, businessman and he was very happy to make huge endowments to BNHS. Apart from being a close friend, he also was a benefactor for BNHS and he, uh, he uh, supported a number of BNHS research programs and uh, uh, other work that time. But again, there's a tragedy because he died in an air crash at a young age and that was very sad for the, uh, Salim Ali, a big loss for him. So, Going back and forth, going back to 1944 onwards, there was a spate of publications, and these were all based on the on the travels that he had done in the past few decades. So the birds of Sikkim came out from the from from his travel there. Birds of Kerala came out from from his travels there, and um, hill birds and common birds and birds of the eastern Himalaya. All these, of course, there are only a few of them anymore. Uh, and also at the same time, simultaneously working on this handbook, which came out only in 1970, 74 or so. So he was extremely productive and extremely busy uh, throughout 
for several, for all his life and for these particular decades. Uh, and he named his autobiography, which came out again in the 70s or 80s, I think, uh, the, the Fall of a Sparrow, which immortalized that yellow-throated sparrow that he had killed as a, as a boy, which sparked his interest to a great extent. And apart from uh, books, he also wrote a number of um, easy to read uh, articles, you know, for the lay public. Uh, and these, all, these, all these books were actually forged from his meticulous notes, and um, which he used to like sit down like this every day and write very, very carefully. He would note everything. And it's because of his, I had the great honor and pleasure of uh, seeing some of his field uh, records and notes. And it was, it was a joy to see his absolute the calligraphic handwriting, perfectly legible, no scratches, no erasures, or from all his, uh, you know, writing on an old-fashioned typewriter, again, no mistakes at all. It was, he was a perfectionist, and you could see the perfection in his work. And this, all this perfection, all this uh, meticulous work resulted in all these books, a number of scientific uh, uh, articles, uh, papers, research papers, and uh, you know, articles for the lay public, he wrote. So as I said, he wrote for popular magazines in a very informative and educative style of his own, a kind of a conversational style. And he also gave radio talks. And in that, he would always put in quite a lot of humor. He would refer to himself as a khaki-clad garage mechanic type because he'd wander about in dusty clothes and carrying all his equipment. Or when somebody called, said that, you know, Sab, you look a bit like a bird yourself, because he had this big hook nose and he had very quick movements. So he'd say, yes, it's because I have such a sweet singing voice, which of course he didn't have. He had a very high pitched and crackly kind of a voice, but he made fun of himself like that. And that was a great joy of, 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 of knowing this and knowing him. And he was a family man. He'd never, uh, never forgot his. I mean, he never forgot to spend time. He always spent time with his family and his close relatives and friends. Uh, this is his sister and brother-in-law with whom he lived for 40 years. And then this is his nephew, Humayun Abdul Ali, uh, who also worked with him uh, in his bird studies and other relatives and friends. And uh, this is Pali Hill, Pali Hill House. So once, much, much later in the 1980s, when I was a student and I had to visit him there, he said, you know, Pali Hill, of course, is the, is the famous abode of the film stars. So he told me, if you get lost, don't worry. Just ask for Dilip Kumar's house. My house is next door. So this is the kind of jokes that he always liked to, uh, liked to crack every now and then. So now coming to independence, independent India. Uh, the BNHS, which was completely a British-run organization, uh, passed on to Indians, Indians. And when the British left, Salim Ali uh, became the curator then the secretary and then the president, which he was till the end of his life, rest of his life, he was there. And under his leadership, it progressed and in fact, it surged forward to become a research, prestigious research and conservation institution. When it had earlier been a kind of like a club, you know, the, the members were all British and they would, uh, um, they would meet together and uh, they were amateurs, they were amateurs, they were not professionals. Where this became now a professional uh, institute. The University of Bombay recognized BNHS as a guiding institution and then fellowships were instituted for students from the various endowments that he had got, including from Lokwantu and others. And uh, I have to say, I was a beneficiary of that. I got a fellowship from the Salim Ali Lokwanto Fellowship, for which I'm utterly grateful. So being this also became a countrywide organization. It was called Bombay Natural History Society. It had projects all over the country and field, field stations all over the country. And the journal became an eminent scientific journal for, uh, for scientific research. And it was a great time of transition and change at that time. You, know, you can imagine from when it was passing on from post in the pre-independence to post-independence, the new laws that came in, the old laws that went out. And uh, so now Salim Ali was at the top. He was the helm of affairs and he concentrated on advancing Indian ornithology and natural sciences and towards uh, conservation. And political situation had changed. 
And so Salim Ali actually modified his own views. Uh, he completely stopped hunting and he stopped uh, the whole idea of uh, bird collection. And he was vehemently uh, against uh, any kind of poaching, particularly of endangered species, which of course he always was against poaching. But um, hunting itself, he 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 uh, completely called a no no from then onwards, and he was appalled by you know, huge shoots for no reason at all. You know, people going and shooting thousands of birds on a day just for the sake of you know having this big bag, and he, he I disproved that completely. And in pretty strong language, I call them holocaust and shoot gargantuan shoots and despicable gang resorts. He used quite strong language about people like that. And he, now it was clear that there was no need for guns any longer. He himself stopped collecting birds, which he had to do earlier, because there were so many new methods now. You know, They didn't need to kill a bird at all. You just had to observe it, and you had to catch it and release it again. There were all these new techniques that had come up, which he learned in, in, uh, in Europe when he was there. So and he, he always liked to tell this to all of us. So all you need in the way of equipment is a good pair of field glasses, a notebook, a pencil and the goodly stop of patience and the capacity to observe keenly and record faithfully. This was his message uh, constantly to all of us. So he really believed in empirical research and in faithful, unbiased, uh, he used to never be dogmatic. You always told all his students, don't be dogmatic. Keep your mind open and be intelligent in your observations and interpretations. And he connected so many disciplines between birds and plants, between botany and zoology, geography and geoclimate. And he laid the foundation for this kind of interdisciplinary study approach of, for biological sciences. And these were the kind of new methods, uh, very old methods now, but at that time they were fairly new, that, that uh, tapping birds using a mist net and then catching them and putting these, uh, uh, you know, either a neck band or a leg band around them. And then releasing them after that, measuring them and, you know, and just taking them out and releasing them quite uh, without harming them in any way. And he always acknowledged the traditional knowledge of the local trappers and the tribal who helped him. Sometimes they even put a satellite tracking uh, unit on, on, a, on the bigger birds. So these were all the methods of capture and release, uh, which did not need any uh, harming the bird in any way at all. So, Another, so, the bird, uh, so these kind of studies were his favorite and he had many favorites and this uh, economic ornithology was a very uh, deep favorite of his, I would say, uh, because he, he, he wanted to show the usefulness of birds and how economically important they are, which seemed like strange to most people. How would they, they couldn't understand what he meant by that. So, he explained a lot that way, that is that birds are pollinators and by pollination, I mean, it's so important for, uh, for agriculture and for forestry. Uh, many birds are insectivores, they, they, kill, they kill and eat huge numbers of plant uh, pests. They are the natural insecticides really. And the, the birds that eat fruits, the frugivorous birds are responsible for spreading the seeds of all the useful species like figs and they, uh, they are seed dispersers and very important for natural forests. And the water birds, they actually fertilize the soil and water with their, with their guano. So he, he, he wanted to uh, really consolidate the fact of birds' economic importance. And he was also particularly fond of the birds of prey because they are the ones uh, who are controlling rats and mice, which are so destructive to crops. So for, for human benefit, he, he wanted to show that birds have great human benefit, benefit to humans, beneficial to humans and to farmers and to um, foresters. Actually, way back in 1934, uh, Salim Ali written to the British Viceroy at that time, to the Imperial Council for Agriculture Research, saying that let us please institute on economic ontology subject and that didn't happen right up to 1992 when finally the Indian Council, Indian Council for Agriculture Research instituted the All India Coordinated Project on Economic Ornithology in different centers of India. And see, Salimani was never 
sentimental. He never said that oh, all birds are great and, and wonderful, but he did know that there are many birds that are quite destructive to crops, like many animals are. And there are certain birds like parakeets and um, certain grain-eating birds like starlings, which, which can destroy uh, huge amounts of, of cropped grains and they can destroy fruits. Uh, in orchards. So he, he never felt that, you know, sentimental about them, that they have to be controlled. But he was very particular that they should never be eliminated. That was the, that was the turn, that was actually the crux of the matter. They can be controlled in different manners, in different ways. They can be deterred, but they cannot be eliminated. This was what he said. He, he absolutely um, was sympathetic with farmers and cultivators because he said, how can you expect them? To have any to to see you know to see to see conservation when they are attacking his their crops they are eating up half the and they don't get half the they don't even get half their value for their uh, the work that they've done so he said we have to devise a realistic strategy and that's what he aimed at in uh, economic ornithology to devise policies and strategies to help farmers uh, to um, live in coexistence with these animals and birds. So as I said, bird migration was a, a very deep interest for him. He called it the like of wonder. He stood in wonder of, of these birds that could undertake you know, massive journeys several times in their lifetime every year. Look how, I mean, the thousands of kilometers that they traveled. And it was uh, Salim Ali and his team who, 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 who discovered these routes from, to India. And uh, they, they, they tagged these birds and uh, they traced, tracked them as they flew uh, back and forth to India. And uh, this is also some birds that are just almost locally, they might return within India, a little above. That's why he went into Tibet. He wanted to go to Tibet to see where these birds nest. They nest here and they come here, all over here in, in, the, in the nest here in the summer, and they come here in the, in the winter months to escape from the cold over there. So, but this bird migration study actually uh, resulted in another wonderful project which I'll just tell you about in a minute. Um, see, once independence came and Salim Ali was famous and the uh, BNHS became a prestigious institution, uh, Salim Ali himself became a very influential figure. He was able to uh, convince you know, people in power to on policy decisions uh, to, in, to, to to, to develop protected areas, to develop different kinds of laws and policies and, and to set aside uh, areas for, uh, for conservation. So he has persuaded uh, Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru uh, to set up uh, some of the to Bhatpur wetland and other places and other uh, senior ministers he, and Maharajas, he persuaded them to stop their killing and to, to protect those areas. So he became an influential policy maker, uh, policy influencer as well. So now coming back to that uh, uh, bird migration project, um, again, because of WHO, because of BNHS's fame, the WHO also came in and, and they wanted them to do a huge, they had a collaboration to do an enormous bird migration study because a strange viral disease was being found in, in, in Karnataka, which was replicated somewhere in former Russia, in Omsk. So they, the, the feeling was that maybe migratory birds are carrying this virus. And they said the viruses were on ectoparasites and small ticks and mites which are sitting on the bodies of these birds. So an enormous project was carried out to, uh, to thousands of migratory birds were, were captured uh, through the Smith netting and other methods. And the ticks were removed from their bodies and uh, sent to the Viral Research Institute, Virus Research Institute in Pune for examining to see if there were any uh, viruses that they were carrying. So now with this interdisciplinary project, Salim Ali actually connected um, ornithology with medical science. So he, this is the kind of uh, uh, information and knowledge that he wanted to pass on to people. Another very significant project that was done by the BNS during his time was the ecological study of bird hazards at Indian aerodromes. You know, the terrible, terrible accidents because of bird hits, especially on a military aircraft. And uh, so there was, it was a very serious concern because the loss of young lives and loss of so much resources. So BNHS, uh, the Ministry of Defense, did a major project and they studied these um, 
aerodromes and did very detailed study of the flight patterns and where the birds occurred and what time would be more safe for them to fly and, and daytime, nighttime. They did very serious studies and major reports came out uh, on each of those aerodromes and huge recommendations were given, which if followed uh, would have definitely, which they did follow, I'm sure, and saved uh, innumerable lives and uh, huge amounts of uh, resource. Um, Salim Ali really believed in communication and he said that, you know, uh, the laws by themselves are important unless you have the backing of strong and well-informed public opinion. And so he reached out to students, to people of senior executives, politicians, scientists, Maharajas, and even to school children uh, to convey the message of the conservation and uh, bird study and, of course, nature conservation. And uh, so to quote again, eminent Professor Madhav Gadgil, he was the man, Salim Ali was the man who taught Indians to appreciate, to study at first hand, to treasure, and to work towards conserving the rich living heritage of this country. That's a huge tribute to Dr. Salim Ali from me. And his outreach didn't end there. He went to international conferences and he spoke for, for conservation of wetlands and grasslands and you know, all the ecosystems in our country. And he addressed uh, huge gatherings as, uh, as well through his uh, writings and talks. Now coming to Salim Ali as a teacher, he inspired his students and staff with his own you know, he was so tireless. He was, he, even at the age of 80, he could walk and, and walk so fast and he would sleep late, get up early. He, I mean, he would be ready before any of us for any kind of a bird uh, expedition. Uh, he inspired us, inspired the students and staff with his energy, his, his dedication, his, met, 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 his meticulousness and his tirelessness. And, and he would suffer no laxity of any sort. And... Uh, he, he expected the highest standards from everybody, whether it was an ordinary staff, even if it's a pun in the office or um, it was a senior uh, colleagues in the office, in, in, in the unit. Uh, he expected high standards and he had a terrible temper. If, uh, if he, he didn't like something, he would really make it known and people were very afraid of his temper. But everybody knew that his criticism his scathing criticism is only because it was because of shoddy work or inefficiency or laziness or slowness. This was the kind of thing that really annoyed him badly. And he made it known. I have to admit, I, I, was a, I suffered from his uh, disapproval as well several times, no doubt about that. But his education was field-based. And, here, and he, he sent out his students all over the country. This is in Maharashtra, and this is Nilgiri, this is in Assam, and this is me in uh, Tamil Nadu. He was, uh, he did that. And, but like a true guru, he would get to know us, get to know our families, and come and stay with us. And uh, he had a kind of a bond with each one of his students, which each one of them will, will talk exactly like me. They will say that they have, all had this uh, intimate bond with, 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 they all called him his guru, they called him old man very affectionately and the greatest of regard. He visited all of us in our houses. And when after work in the evenings when he sit with us, he would chat and talk and the conversation was so scintillating and educative and full of you know, laughter and humor. He loved ice cream, he loved fruits. And when you're living in Sri Lanka and you visit me, that's where you can get durian, very rare to get anywhere else. So the first thing as soon as he walked into the door, he said, where is my durian? It is like that, you know, it is it's a complete, um, when he was at work, it was absolute, had to be you know, top class. And when he was uh, with us, he was a most charming and wonderful uh, guest person to have. So if you look at Salim Ali's legacy, his writings and awards bought him money, but he plowed it all into his uh, into the institution that he built. He even built another institution called Sandy Mali Center for Ornithology and Natural History, which came up, of course, after he died, unfortunately. And very early on, more than 50 years ago, he started the concept of citizen science. Uh, like, you know, he, he would write out 
in, in, in uh, he would write and appeal to the public. He said, tell me if you see anything interesting. Tell me if you see this in endangered species, or if you see if some bird comes in, a migratory species comes in. You write to me, he would say. That's why citizen science has now become a movement where lay people are writing in and uh, uh, you know sending observations and uh, records, which are going to make huge difference to science in the future, citizen science. So he was a popular figure and legend in his lifetime. There were books and documentaries and broadcasts and stamps on Salimali. There's even an Amar Chitra Katha on him. Uh, I could show how popular he was as a person and as a, as a, as a scientist. And uh, the kind of work that he did, he inspired. He inspired so many, he inspired countless uh, thousands of, of young people uh, with his uh, uh, with his work and 70 years after his, his uh, more than 70 years after his uh, study of, um, of Kerala, he, uh, he, he, this group of young people followed his exact footsteps and they traced it to the day and the kind of valuable information that they can get to see the changes, it's so important, it has huge repercussions for the, for the future. Another group did the Kerala, uh, the Karnataka study. They followed it day by day, more than 70 years on. So you can imagine uh, there would be, of course, huge changes, but are these man-made changes, are these changes on the climate change? All these are the scope for future research, which is what Salim Ali's vision always was. So to conclude, it is Salim Ali's vision is what he said. I'll read this out now. It says, what is now required is the understanding of the fact that human ecology is an integral part of nature conservation. And all who take a total view of life on Earth must realize that man's future cannot be considered separately from other forms of life. He, he emphasized that humans are a part of nature. So with that, I give you a glimpse of uh, the life and times of Salim Ali, a great scientist and a very unique person. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Dharagandhi. This was a wonderful portrayal of, of this uh, very rich uh, scientist, multidisciplinary, as you said. And I think the, the, the term uh, father of Indian ornithology is, is totally deserved. I mean, nobody can compare to, to what he did in terms of, of range of, of work, persistence, and meticulous care. And as you said, very, very uh, uh, this was very important, I think, in your presentation, the, the way he reached out to all other disciplines that were interconnected. This is the time to thank you again very warmly. It was, it was a very lively presentation, and we were able especially to feel the entire person. I think that that's what is most important at the end. So thank you very much, Mrs. Tarangandi, for spending Thank your you very time. much. I feel very deeply honored by this. Thank you. Yeah.